Ryan, thank you so much for being on the show today. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, for those watching or listening and that haven't had a pleasure of meeting you, could you kind of share with everyone your name, your company name, and where you guys are located? Sure. Thanks for having me, Bob. Uh, it's a pleasure. So um, I'm Brian Vandestreek. I am the general manager of uh, Vredevo Heating, Cooling, and Plumbing, or Plumbing, Heating, AC. You know, it just depends on uh, where it shows up online. We are in the... Uh, Central and Western Michigan locations. Um, we have Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, and Lansing. That's incredible. And you guys have, have really taken off the last, well, I mean, it's, it was a big business before you stepped in, but now it's a really big business. Uh, this is your chance to brag a little bit. Uh, how much have you guys grown from, uh, you know, 2020 to say uh, projecting at the end of this year, 23? Yeah, so we're we're looking at doubling our top line revenue from about twenty million dollars uh, to forty million dollars, Lord willing, at the end of this this year. So, I mean, the leadership team has done, you know, just a phenomenal job. So, you know, shout out to Scott and Drew and my director of operations, uh, you know, Samantha and HR and Amanda and marketing and you know everybody else. I mean, they've really, really done you know, a phenomenal job over the last two years of kind of getting us to where we are now. And it has really been a pleasure to be a part of it, Bob. That's amazing. Well, for that kind of growth, you do have to have a great team. Sure. It's been profitable growth and, and it's been busy growth. Uh, I know uh, before I hit record, we were chatting and I interviewed the original, you know, well, not the original. The original was their father, uh, Dennis, I believe, if I remember his name, started the business in 64. But then his sons, Tom and Mike, took it over, and I interviewed them in 2011 for Old Magazine, and I think they were just like a couple million bucks, and I, and then they grew it to the 20 mark, right, before you handing yeah. off to you? Yeah, you know, um, those guys did such a phenomenal job of running this business, you know, with integrity and character, um, yeah. you know, and that was really the biggest, you know, the draw for me to, to come and, 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 and take on this role was... I was coming into an organization where the character was aligned with, you know, my own personal values of faith, my experiences in the military prior to that, everything just, you know, aligned incredibly well. Um, yeah. So those guys were looking for somebody to come in so they could, you know, kind of sail off into the sunset and, you know, we couldn't be happier for that. I mean, those guys are phenomenal. I still have breakfast with Mike on a regular basis. We go to the same church. You know what I mean? So our wives, our friends, and and it's fun because we can kind of look back and um, have those conversations. And I, you know, my first exposure to certain path SGI at that time was the San Antonio yeah. Expo, oh, and I had only I had only been on board for you know a handful of months. And I remember like walking into the first I don't even know, and I was like, what is going on here? Because I didn't have. <laughs> you know, the background in, you know, residential services. I remember Mike saying when they left their first event in Chicago, they said, if we can just get to $1 million, like, we'll <laughs> get it. <laughs> yeah. You know, so they have those conversations now, and I'm looking at, how do I do a million dollars this week? We, you know, yeah. I mean, is, uh, is a completely different um, challenge, but we're doing it the same way, just with different levers to pull. That's fantastic. Yeah, and if I remember, I think they came from a new construction too. I, and I mean, that's they've they, they've done a lot of hard work, and and it's great that you're honoring them and and, and continuing that progression. It's 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 remarkable. Yeah, um, you know, and that's that's important. You know, for this organization and the customers that we have here is that, you know, we honor those guys with the legacy that their father started and what they really built by flipping it from new construction. Um, you know, so that's at the forefront of my mind and my leadership team's mind on a regular basis is how do we continue to do this the right way? And how do we continue to, you know, let customers know that, hey, we're doing this the same way. We're just, we're tweaking some things to, to give them an advantage as homeowners. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, you pointed out something earlier. I think it's important to mention you walked into a business that was founded on some strong core values and core beliefs. So I mean, maybe there were some heads that needed to be changed, but it sounds like you probably walked in a strong situation where you were here to pour gasoline on the growth, not necessarily having to fix a broken business. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and I would tell anybody who's watching this or listening that, um, you know, this was an amazing organization before I got here. So, 
I mean, I can't take credit for the going from 20 to $40 million. The, you know, the foundation was laid, you know, 60 years ago. Um, and then when Mike and Tom went to their first SGI event and said, that's the business model that we're going to follow. I mean, and, and they did, um, and they followed it to a T and then I think when we got to $20 million, Scott and I were looking at some of the, some of the models on certain bath and we're like, there's no plan to get from 20 to 50. So like, we're going to have to figure it out, you know, on our own. But you know, the core of what we do is, is in the foundational principles of those values. And then of what certain path helped Mike and Tom do. Um, and we just, I took those and utilized my background and experience and just said, well, what if we did this? And what if we did this? And what if we did this? And what if we did this? And, yep. Um, it's, it's honestly, it's been just a, a riot to be a part of. That's great. You know, it's fun. Uh, it's interesting. I, I, I'm working on some projects for Expo in Temecula and I've been looking at a lot of like, uh, reports on Eagles, which are larger members are our large revenue members. And we have some coaches out there talking with some, and, you know, and they, a lot of companies that are doing great, but there's things that are areas of improvement. It comes down to the basics and you kind of pointed that out. You execute the basics. You know, it's just about finding the right people to lead those people to do the basics every day. That's what generates revenue. That's what generates profit. It comes down to doing the right things every single day. Yeah, you know, and it's it's funny because, you know, before we hit record, uh, um, you know, you had mentioned, I don't know if you had um, watched or listened to, but I think you had Carl on was the last time. Yeah. Um, and Carl and I, believe it or not, I've never met him, but like our backgrounds are, are very similar, except for the fact that I didn't do it in the skilled traits like he did. So Mm -hmm. reviewing, you know, P and L and then looking at uh, where you need to go and making continuous improvement changes. And like, those are all things that I did when I got here because it was like, everybody wants to leave a legacy. Um, by enriching people's lives who work for you, you know, all while taking care of your customer. I, I remember getting here and go, how do I make this better? Like these guys pretty much had it all ready to go. Um, and then it was just a, you know, like, oh, I can't just come in here and maintain a $20 million business. The goal is to, is to grow and to yep. be able to hire more people and to be able to impact more people's lives. But to your point, it, it, it starts with the phone call. I mean, it's the basic. Um, yep. And anybody who who knows me knows I'm incredibly passionate about call centers. So shout out to all you CSRs and CEPs out there who might be listening. I mean, I spend a ton of time in my call center reviewing scripts. You know, what what things can we do to make their lives better? Because yep. it's a high turnover job, but it's the most important job in our organization is who answers the phone. So yeah, yeah back to the basics is, is incredibly important. I'm gonna dig, I want to dig into that in a minute. Uh, before I lose sight of it, I love uh, learning people's individual stories, and I think it tells so much about them. So let's let's dig into yours just for a couple minutes. So you said military? Did you jump in the military right after high school, or when did that happen? No. So I I went to college first, and then I joined the military. But I did go the enlisted route instead of the officer. I I mean, like full transparency, I probably wasn't ready to lead people at that time. Uh, um, so I was just kind of looking for something that, you know, I could be, you know, was bigger than myself and I could be a part of the team. And I had kind of felt this, you know, calling to kind of go and do it. Both of my grandfather served in the military and, you know, after college, I think I was, you know, pouring concrete and probably not utilizing the, the gifts God had given me to my fullest uh, potential. And sure. my older brother, you know, had kind of said to me like, Hey, you, you need to go do something, you know, better. Uh, and so I, I did that, uh, for about eight years. Um, and I was a, I was a combat medic in the military. So, uh, oh. that was great for me. So I did, you know, several depo- deployments. Um, so that was kind of my time. And then after I got out of the military, I, uh, I really went the tier one automotive manufacturing route. So oh, supply okay. chain, process engineering, I did some engineering manager roles, plant manager, general manager roles of you know, overseeing different facilities and, um, really just kind of figured out how to make things work better. Um, yeah. And that's that just kind of my background. Yeah. 
and and then talk to how did you cross paths with Mike? Let's talk about that. That's a, I mean, that's a total, um, you know, providential thing that, you know, God put us together. But um, my wife and I were looking for an opportunity to get back to West Michigan. Um, so my parents were here and I moved, moved here, you know, just heading into high school. Um, and mm-hmm. my wife's family was from here and we were living down in Georgia after I got out of the military for about eight or nine years. Uh, wow. You'd then been there I, a long time. Yeah, no. So I, I mean, we were down south for probably 15 plus years and looking for an opportunity to get home. My dad had just uh, retired. He was a college basketball coach here in the area. Um, we had little kids at the time and I was like, man, you know, now's the time to, to kind of get back home. Um, right. My dad retiring and everybody kind of there. So I actually worked for who is now a competitor when I was in college um, doing new construction for uh, plumbing. Uh, so I knew who the Vreda Volts were just from doing new construction job sites. And yeah, but I didn't know Mike and Tom. I mean, I just okay. kind of knew who they were. So we were actually visiting up here uh, one day um, and a general manager posting for Vreda Volts Heating and Cooling came up and I was like, there's no way these guys are going <laughs> to be able to, you know, see my skill set and translate it. But I remember telling my wife, like, what a cool opportunity to, you know, kind of get out of the hustle and bustle of manufacturing and come and do something where I can plant some roots down. Sure. So I just did what probably most people do. They, you know, attach your CV or your resume and send it over and, you know, send a little prayer. And I did that. And about 30 minutes later, Mike sends me a note. He's like, wow, Hey, I just saw minutes. your, he said, I saw your resume and love to, um, you know, get in touch with you sometime in the next week. And I replied, well, I'm actually in town now from Georgia. If you want to, um, you know, grab coffee and mind you, it's to the middle of the pandemic. Right. right. So you just you don't quite know where people are. If they're, you know, they don't want to meet in person, if they want to do it in zoom and Mike says, why well, you just come to my house? <laughs> so, um, I'm like, this is like, who, you know, cause it's, you know, Mike's the CEO of a pretty successful business in West Michigan. Like who just does that? You know, right. so I went to his home and we were actually leaving the next day to drive back down to Georgia, like 16 hours. And I totally bailed. on like a family commitment to go meet Mike. And yeah. I probably spent three hours in his living room, just, you know, kind of talking about my work history and what it was that I was looking to do and, you know, what, I, what I wanted to provide for my family, what things I was passionate about you know, kind of shared my faith story with him and that aligned with what he was looking to do in the business. And, um, that was like almost three years ago, like this time, it just took a little yep. while and things shook out, you know, in, in my favor. And I, I think he would say his favor as well. And, and here we are. Yeah. That's something else. So you, when you had that, I don't know how much of the interview you remember that he, was he talking to first get to know you before talking business was that was that kind of what you remember yeah i mean i think that's kind of what it was and i mean he went to the same university that i went to and west michigan is a small area even though it's pretty big yeah um and so most people who went to calvin college you know knew that my dad you know was the basketball coach there and kind of tied the name so i I, i'm guessing that had something to do with it so shout out to my dad if he ever hears this you know what i mean sure um but yeah i mean that was the biggest thing for mike is i mean the real the relational piece of you know bringing somebody in to to kind of take over is is critically important you know and i think you and i have had a conversation about a year ago we're trying to get connected in denver of yeah. And one of the things that people struggle with is that secession plan. And how do you do that? Well, I was literally just talking to a guy who's a good buddy of mine in Chicago who runs a really nice shop there who's going through the same thing. He's like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do this. And I said, well, let me tell you how Mike and I did it. Yeah. You know, so that was a big thing for Mike was just making sure that him and I were aligned, that it was going to be a good relationship for him and I first and foremost. So then you know, he felt comfortable rolling that out to the rest of the team. Yeah, I'm glad you, you put that on a tee for me. I want to talk about that because there's plenty of businesses, owners in a certain path are dealing with succession planning and they're not always sure, you know, you, you, read, you can read certain things and watch certain things, but 
it always helps to hear someone's personal perspective. So how, what was the plan you and Mike had put in place? How to introduce yourself? Because obviously $20 million business, there's other leaders in the business, right? You're the stranger walking in. So you can get, you know, you got to kind of earn some trust, right? So what was your plan like? How did you kind of get everyone on your side so they're, they're going to listen to you? You know, um, again, Mike and Tom just did a phenomenal job of, of making sure that transition went well. And so for me, um, I spent the kind of the first week just, you know, kind of walking around. And I, I bet it was Wednesday and I started on a Monday. He put me in the call center for like an entire month and not in the call center, like hang out with the call center manager. Like, Hey, as a matter of fact, we've got two CEPs who are starting too. And you're just going to go through onboarding and orientation with that. Like you're going to learn scripts. You're going to take live phone calls. You're going to call. And it was terrifying. You know what <laughs> I mean? My, sure. Yeah. My current call center manager and um, my marketing manager who now oversees call center. They, they always remind me that they've got that first live phone call recorded in case I ever, you know, mm-hmm. make a mistake. They can bring that up, you know? Yeah. So um, I started in the call center uh, for about a month. Um and again, that's been the foundation of, of the success that, you know, I, I think I've helped with this organization is that is such a critical component to the business. And if I wouldn't have done that first, I would not have had success learning the other departments. So from there, I went to dispatch. Then I went and worked with service for a couple of weeks. Then I went and spent a couple of months, not even a couple of months, a couple of weeks in installation. And then... I came back and did some administrative stuff, spent time with APAR, and then Mike gave me a price book. He said, I'm going to have you go run sales calls. And that may have even been more scary than being on the phones. Um, and it shouldn't be, and it's not now, but at that point in time, um, I was like, I've never done sales before in my entire life. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm a supply chain guy, process engineer by trade. Like, that's... Um, and once I went into that first home and had that experience of selling who the brand was, you know, not necessarily the equipment, but who the Vredevogs were, who our installers were, everything that we do in the call center, because Mike, little to my knowing, was preparing me for that opportunity, that phone call, that $10,000 sale or whatever it was at the time, I was able to, to walk that client all the way through why you choose great of when you don't choose somebody else. And I remember when, when he said yes, after I slid his options across the table, like yeah. everything clicked. I mean, everything clicked for me. Yeah. Um, and so we did that for probably four or five months, Bob three. Yeah. Somewhere in there. And then yeah. he just kind of said, I think you've got it. And, um, you know, started letting me lead the, you know, the weekly leadership meetings and facilitate, you know, conversation amongst all the other you know, leaders in the organization. And that was probably June. And yeah. it's just, it's kind of been, you know, our leadership's team show since then. And he would come in, you know, a couple of times a week. And then slowly by the end of the year, he, him and Tom, you know, retired and yeah. kind of walk, you're off without a hitch. What a beautiful onboarding process. It's really the way to do it. So for somebody that's not doesn't really know the industry, you know, how do you lead it if you don't know what every division does, right? So in, in the best way to learn it is to do it, right? And also, yeah, the, when you're, right. And in, in what we were talking about, and to me, I'm thinking the whole time, everyone in those departments are getting to meet and know you well. All of a sudden, you're not the scary guy that's taken over. What's he going to do? <laughs> I don't know. What is he really like? You know, is he going to change everything? And they're like, they're like oh, he's a good guy. He's a normal guy. And we're showing him what we're doing and then all of a sudden there's that trust right so when you come in you can make changes you can you can make suggestions that everyone's like okay there's a trust there people are, are more willing to listen yeah and i think too you know i've had the opportunity to to talk with some other companies you know throughout the midwest and um a lot of guys don't understand how a decision in one department can positively or negatively impact everybody else, you know? And so what I always say too, is like, you need to understand like what customer you're impacting. 
you know, whether it's an internal customer or it's an external customer. Um, and so for me, I got the opportunity to, to live that, you know, if we make a change, a process change here for a service technician, it may be great for them, but it may be a pain in the butt for the dispatcher who's got to generate that purchase order for that random part that we don't have on our truck, which then has got to go to the guy who's receiving it in the warehouse. And then how does that get to APAR to, you know what I mean? So yeah, I think, I think from, you know, one of the things that was beneficial for me coming in without knowing the business is I got to kind of connect those dots to where now I can take a step back and go, Hey, that's great. But how does that impact this person? I, I, for sure. Now, when you, when you stepped in, in 2020, were was it just the, still the original location by itself in Granville, Grand Rapids area, or the others had popped up yet? So I'm trying to think of the exact timeline. But I want to say like 2000, mid 2010s. Is that how you say that? 15, 16? I think we, we, we'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mike and Tom had secured a location um, in Cal, well, it was actually technically Plainwell at that time. Now it's Kalamazoo. And then a shop in Lansing, Michigan, um, just as a, Hey, there's only so many mailboxes in Grand Rapids that we can get to. I mean, Grand Rapids is sprawling, but it's not overly populate, you know, depths in population. So uh, when I had come on board, we did have three locations and our branch locations are doing probably a, a million in revenue, which is, I mean, it's a nice size shop. But, um, since then we have, um, added a fourth location, which is on the lakeshore um, in Holland. And I think this year, our Lansing and Kalamazoo brands are set to do between, I don't know, five and seven million dollars each. Now, what's the breakdown between HVAC and general for the whole company? I know it's hard to go branch. So, I mean, I would say we're probably still 85, 90% HVAC. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and we didn't, I mean, when I came on board, we didn't have plumbing yet. So okay. um, we now have 14 plumbers and a master plumber on staff. And I think Scott's targeting about $3.5 million in plumbing sales. Um, you know, one of the big pushes that, you know, Scott and I really, really charged hard on was making sure that our branch locations receive plumbing just i don't i don't know what other people feel and this isn't a a shot at you know our our plumbing contractors a part of certain path but i feel like that is one of the, the biggest underserved markets out there for just normal homeowners like it's so hard to find a plumber who can show up on time and yeah. has a button shirt and you know what i mean can can sure. do all the things that we normally did on in the air time you know what I mean? Yep. And so Scott did just a phenomenal job of growing that department and getting it to all of our locations. So now we've got three experienced plumbers in each one of our locations. Support for this podcast comes from Goodman. There's a good reason why Goodman is one of the biggest names in heating, cooling, and energy efficient home comfort. The brand has been around for decades, and you'll probably find one of Goodman's nationwide distributors in your neighborhood near you. And since Goodman products are designed, engineered, and assembled in the USA, you can feel good knowing that one of the best values for high-quality HVAC equipment is available where and when you need it. It's no wonder homeowners and local contractors say, thank goodness for Goodman. Look for and be sure to follow Goodman on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. You said Scott, is, what is his position in the business? So Scott has recently been promoted to our director of operations. Congratulations, um, Scott. So Scott was Mike's right-hand guy when I got here. Scott and I actually went to high school together. He was a couple really? of years. He, we were a couple of years apart um, in school, but he is hitting his 20-year milestone this year. Uh, and I couldn't ask for a better guy, a better advocate for who we are and our core values. And he started 
um, an install and moved into service and then became a team leader. And then he was the service manager when I got here. And, you know, he's the epitome of, of what you want in somebody who can help grow a business um, and is going to do it the right way every time. Was he now, was he the one that spearheaded the plumbing? It's what, what it kind of sounded like. Someone has to kind of own it or, or did you work yeah. with them in tandem? Cause that's very, such a very different model HVAC to plumbing, right? And there's that hurdle. And then there's, you, you've got the size of a business and you gotta be careful not to market it too much. Then it can get out of control. And I mean, there's all sorts of things you have to be careful with. Yeah, you know, and um, I think Scott would tell you that the story went something like from Mike to Scott, like, hey, we're going to do plumbing and you're in charge of it now. <laughs> you know, and I think I had been here all of, you know, maybe a couple of weeks, um, yeah. you know, and so for us, it was, you know, we we jumped into a certain path and we were like, what does the price book look like? How you do, what do you charge for a trip charge? How do you? You know, and so he was the guy who did all of the work in the background to look at pricing and what parts do we need, what do we need to stock. Um, I had the easy task of deciding how many plumbers do we want, you know what I mean, or where do we want to go, you know what I mean. So Scott and I's relationship is is great in that we get to play off of each other and that we know what each other's strengths are, we know what each other's weaknesses are. I'm not a a trades guy normally now I'm you know about three years in and I know a tremendous amount but sure. it's because Scott had to tell me that that was the wrong way to do it and here's the right way to do it so many times yeah. um but you know I would push him on kind of where we need to go from the customer's perspective like what we're hearing in the home what our technicians what like how do we get here how do we get here and Scott would always say hey we can do it it's going to take time but he's the guy who you know, really put the boundaries in place and figured out how to do it. And then him and I were, you know, talking on a daily basis, but it was, we wanted all of our club members to have the same experience with plumbing that they have with our HVAC service technicians. And that's really, really difficult to do. So first and foremost for us, it took us probably a year to find a master plumber who fit the bill who was cool with wearing a white button down shirt and black pants and a black belt and black boots and had an impact imaging statement and wanted to be a part of it, wanted to help us grow it. And I mean, we didn't, he's probably one of the few people that we hired with experience Yeah, because it was easier for us to hire guys with the right core values and the right attitude. And we taught them. You know, we started with water heaters and we've got six probably apprentices now that are just, I don't want to say they're hanging out. So, but yeah, that's Plenty. what we found was successful. We, we yeah. did hire some guys that had experience and it just, it was really difficult for us to get them to fall into how we wanted to run our business the way we did on the HVAC side. So sure. yeah, Scott was the, Scott was the driver. I was kind of the visionary, um, yeah. but I mean, let me. Yeah. Let me ask you this real quick, because I, I think this is an important point I want to point out for people is when Scott was given this role, what was he doing previously? Was he was he managing service or install or was he operations manager over everything? So when so Scott recently, just in the last two weeks, got promoted to director of operations. Yeah. Um, prior to that, he was the operations manager overseeing kind of all things operations, but just in the in the last little bit, we formalized some roles for uh, some men in our organization who became branch managers of our satellite locations um, to better take care of our team members that were there. there. Um, and what I mean by that is we had grown those branches to such an extent that they, they deserved to have somebody who was going to be there each and every day. Yeah. Uh, and prior to that, they were all reporting to somebody who was at kind of our centralized hub, which was great, but I don't think we would have been able to continue to grow if they didn't have the support and the resources that they needed in their location. So at the time Scott got plumbing, he was the service manager, 
But then when we got a master plumber in, he learned how to do things a Vredo both way for about 10 months. Then we pulled him out of the field, made him a plumbing manager. He reported to Scott. Scott now got promoted, and now my plumbing manager reports to my Grand Rapids branch manager and then kind of dot a line to Scott so that he can oversee everything. I think, what, yeah, I mean, that's that's amazing. The patience you have. And I think that's what the point I, I want to try to get across to people. So often they get into new trades and like, we're going to start answering plumbing calls tomorrow. I just hired a plumber yesterday. We're gonna, we're just going to go do it. And you're like, holy cow, that can blow up so fast. But what you did is you gave Scott the ability to, to kind of step away from the HVAC side a bit, focus really on plumbing, do it the right way, find the plumber, onboard the plumber the right way. And so as he did that, the HVAC side was okay because you had other leaders to step in his place. Run yep. So that's that's the way you got to do it. And it, it's going to cost you some money up front, but that cost is an investment just to launch a new division. Yeah, double your training budget, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah. So when you, when you first started running calls, did you just start dialing out or did you change how you answer the phones when people called in and said, Hey, we're doing plumbing now, or how did, cause yeah, it's a slow leak. Cause then get out of control real fast with the size you were in it. In the seat. You know, for me, it wasn't necessarily, um, calling out more. It was taking advantage of what we had coming yeah. in. Um, you know, and it was probably, I don't know, two years ago when we had a marketing partner at the time, um, and this could get down a rabbit hole. So you're going to have, that's all right. Uh, write notes down. I'm good. Who, you know, who wanted to judge their performance of marketing based upon my top line revenue. And I'm sure other people have this same thing. And, and, and here's what I mean. They would say, well, Hey, what did you do last month in revenue? Two and a half million dollars. Well, your spend was 5% or below. So like, we're doing great for you. And I was like, okay, like, sure. Like that's within my budget, but like, yeah. how many new customers did you bring to me? You know, cause my club members are going to call me anyways. So if 50% of my replacement revenue came from existing people, like I was going to get that anyways, like you can't take credit for that. And so they couldn't produce for me a customer list that wasn't already in my CRM. Okay. And so this is probably one of the, you know, best gifts God has ever given me is that I really love data. Um, and so that's what kind of started when I would say is like the KPI revolution at Vredevo was yeah. I needed to figure out how to call him on his bluff. If you right, or like, how do I know that spending 30% of my marketing budget in TV and cable with one channel in Grand Rapids is the right thing to do? And I, I just, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about marketing. I didn't go to school for marketing. So we just started this, hey, how many club members did we book today of the phone calls that came in? How many work club members when they called in? How many got converted when they were on the phone? So getting back to your initial question, like I started with, are we taking advantage of the phone calls that come in first? How many abandoned calls did we have? One report that I would have my team do for me for a little, for a short period of time is I want to know every time we said no yesterday, yeah. like how many times did we say no? Because if it's got into a trend of work that we could do, then it's a matter of going, Hey Scott, we're now doing rooftop units. Cause we said no 10 times this week. Right. Right. Like, wait, I have a crane. We can't do that, Brian. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. those are the things I would just go in there. And be like, I remember when I was in the call center and we would say, well, you're out of our service area, even though it was five minutes away and somebody wanted a new furnace and air conditioner. And I'm like, no, we're saying yes to that now. Yeah. 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 A hundred zip codes since I came on board. Um, Cause I was like, they deserve to have the best HVAC company in the state of Michigan come to their home. Like, yeah. why not? What's an extra 10 minutes? You know, so then it became a burden on how do we dispatch? Because we want to dispatch for profit, but we want to dispatch for proximity. And how do we start people? And 
these guys have been incredibly patient uh, yeah. with me as well as we try to figure out, you know, bet more opportunities to win by just saying yes. Yeah, for sure. So how, well, you know, how did you figure that out then? To manage the dispatch? Because you want to dispatch by priority code, but you don't want to send a guy two hours across western Michigan to dispatch. Yeah, I mean, closer. Um, you know, and I've bragged up my, you know, my team quite a bit, um, uh, you know, and I've, you know, I've seen, you know, Gus and Jimmy Dale and all those guys talk about how good their teams are, but, you know, we should do like a, like an iron chef competition with our leadership teams and the way we do <laughs> dispatch calls and the way you, we utilize service Titan. Cause, um, these guys here just do an absolutely phenomenal job and, and, and one thing that we do here is we ask a lot out of our customer experience providers with booking calls for criteria and making sure that they're in the right location and that, um, you know, this call is not overbooked on this technician that's six weeks out when we're booking the preset. So we're not just putting calls into the bucket like a lot of HVAC companies do. Like each time a customer calls in, we're booking you to the right technician with that right skill set based upon our dispatch board is set up. So what we ended up doing is we ended up pulling a lot of that stuff out into spreadsheets so that I can figure out where we were missing opportunities. Yeah. Um, as well as, Hey, what zip codes are we telling people? No, cause we had a log for that. I mean, service Titan's got so many different features that people don't take advantage of that. We just forced ourselves to get really good at to where now, yeah. I mean, any day, if I need a certain, amount of calls in a certain zip code it's just pulling a couple letter levers putting a sheet together and calling to those those people so yeah it's gotten really complex but it's worked for us because we just we started with one yeah yeah so has that been the key to your to your growth is is opening up those new zip codes and kind of target them with your advertising and hitting really a customer base that you had not hit until the last couple of years you know i would i would say that um the growth really stemmed from us allowing the, the leaders in this organization to kind of spread their wings and go, okay. um, giving some of those guys some flexibility to, to make decisions in their departments has been, you know, tremendously impactful for us. But then, you know, we implemented a series of KPIs that allowed us to make decisions proactively early on in the month, as opposed to waiting till we're doing P&L review. And then as you guys know, you're 10 days into the next month, looking at 40 days ago's performance. And we're looking at graphs and trends, you know, every single day, each leader at my organization is responsible for sending out a series of KPIs for the department that they're in to a group of 20 people so that we can help each other if something isn't matching up. Um, and that really allowed us to communicate more effectively than what we probably had been. And again, incredibly successful business before, but when you open up streams of communication and put people in roles for them to be successful, it, it's, it's like putting gasoline on a fire. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, if you don't mind me asking and, and what, what key KPIs, I mean, how many do you really focus on? every single day we're not hitting here it's five alarm fire all hands on deck we got to figure this out you don't have you know, to know the numbers but <laughs> yeah so you know one thing i would tell you that we don't do is i i don't necessarily focus so much on the sales you know which might be counterintuitive to what a lot of people think but i i believe that our sales is a product of everything else that we do well um, from answering the phone to booking the call to getting the right technician there who generates a lead to getting, you know, the right comfort advisor there based on data and their success ratio in that zip code on a single component sale. Like those are all the things that we did. Um, you know, the, the most important one to me that I look at is how many inbound phone calls did I receive on a month to date trend versus last year? Like, that's what I want to know, because that tells me a couple of things. One, are we staying relevant in our marketplace? Do people still think about us when they have an HVAC or plumbing need? Two, is my marketing working? Are my targeted campaigns successful? Three, is there a weather event 
depending upon am I up, am I down, am I neutral? We were having this conversation today because we were down on inbound calls, down on outbound calls, and down on book calls. Yep. And I was asking my team, like, what are we doing? You know, like not in a bad way, but like, what are we, what are we doing? And they said, Brian, last year on the 22nd of August, we flipped from AC to furnace season and we blew our book call numbers out of the water. Like you got to be patient with me for another week, you know? So the calls to me is the absolute most important. And then after that, I look at paid tune-ups by area. So non-club member visit, somebody who's calling in and wants their air conditioner tuned up. Those are the those are the number one things because that's the most important call for me is that yeah. paid tune up, that marketed tune up. Because everything else is, you know what I mean? Like stems from that. It's if I can get in the home to a first time customer and show them what a proper super tune up looks like and provide them options and tell them that we've got plumbing and we offer emergency service and the value of our club membership. Like I have them for life. You own like yep. I need that marketed tune up call. That's my, <laughs> that's the driver for every right. location. And then, uh, Bob, I would tell you the next one is we track how many non club opportunities we get by location every day. And then what do you, what do you classify as an opportunity? 10 year plus? No. So I'm not talking about the equipment type. I'm talking about if you called in, you moved into my territory, your address shows up that you are not a club member of mine. That's how you classify your. I wonder if that tells me if my marketing is working. Yes. Yeah. Cause if you're paying a monthly nominal fee to be on my club membership and like, you're going to call me anyways, if there's an issue. Sure. So that's my number. That's probably my third one. And one of the most important that circling back all the way to the, to the rabbit hole, if you will, is that allowed me to figure out what KPIs I needed to chart out to get back to what do I need to do to get my phone to ring? And, and so that's ultimately, I feel like I cracked a puzzle when I like, when everything kind of aligned and I was like, we can track how many times somebody calls in over last year, you know, and people are always like, well, my marketing's not working. I'm like, well, like, let me listen to some of your phone calls. Like, let yes, yes, hurt. yes, um, yeah. But so those are probably the biggest ones. Inbound calls, marketed two dumps by location. And then I want to know how many club membership opportunity phone calls I have by location. Cause those things tell me, um, is my call center doing a good job? Are they booking calls six weeks out? Like we want them to do with our available club members Two, Am I getting the marketed tune up so that I can convert more club members to where next year, like there's just a, a known fact that I'm going to book them. And then I want to know how many opportunities I have. And then did we capitalize on those? You know, like what's my conversion rate on a daily basis on the month to date trend, you know, and right now we're tracking about 30 plus percent of our opportunities. We're converting into a monthly reoccurring maintenance nice. visit. Um, so yeah, those are the ones I mean, I, we, I go through, I bet I have 40 or 50 KPIs that roll through every day, Bob, and we do it in a little different way than I would say anybody else has ever done it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's probably a whole nother call but it just it that was something that i had done when i got my first engineering manager job at a manufacturing plant was figuring out how i knew that the plant was successful was just creating a here's how many i need every day here's how many i got and then the, it just charts it out so that early on the third day of the month you can pull some levers as opposed to waiting um, and that's been incredibly beneficial for us that we can be proactive Support for this podcast comes from HD Supply. At HD Supply, our job is helping you do yours. We are uniquely positioned to help drive your business through unrivaled access to professional-grade plumbing, electrical and HVAC products, and innovative business solutions such as our StockWise Inventory Management Program, 
fully customizable to meet your needs and improve productivity. Our national network of distribution centers and more than 2,200 store locations nationwide provide a national reach with a local focus, providing unmatched convenience and product availability. We power pros to do more. You have like a, a morning huddle or an afternoon huddle and go, hey, these KPIs, the 50 I'm looking at, there's three that are red. Let's let's create a plan of an action right now. So when do you guys do that? So um, we, our call center, dispatch, and um, service team leaders meet every day at 9 o'clock okay. to review. So it's out the door. Yeah, after everybody's out, you know what I mean? And all of our service technicians dispatch from home, so they don't really come in anyways, except for, you know, Mondays and Tuesdays. They have, you know, a leadership meeting every day where we're going through another topic. Uh, and then at 9.30, we meet as a leadership team every day. Um, and that's a different change for what Breda Bogue was used to, and it's probably a lot of you guys are going to think that's overkill, but I'm an eyeball to eyeball communication guy. Like I'm very relational. Like I want to see people's body language. I want to know if they are concerned about something. And I can't do that on a, on a, on a normal basis. If I can't see you, like I can't help you if I don't know what you need. And so those KPIs, we use uh, Google here. Um, so those go out into a Google chat group that just, they go through and it's just a little snip of the chart of what it looks like. And then there are days that I'll send, you know, like, Hey, what are we doing about this? Or what support do you need? Um, but those are the things that we're addressing, you know, on a daily basis, first and foremost, everybody knows, like my favorite people are in the call center. You know what I mean? Like go in there and give them a high five first. You know what I mean? We talk about that. And then we talk about like, what does dispatch need for the day, you know, or where we're at. And I think for most people, you know, that are, have been a part of a certain path and are following it to a T. Like we try to stay six to six to eight weeks out on our board for, for tune up. So now we're in this weird season right now where we're trying to kind of get to the end of our air conditioning. And when do we turn on furnace and each location's a little bit different. And we're trying to figure out how to push through to get some more marketed tune ups. But I always tell people, this is my favorite time of the year is like February, March, because then people need me. You know what I mean? When it's busy, nobody needs, me. you know what I mean? Right. And that's right. Great too. But uh, we get to be more creative and, you know, people call this the shoulder season, which I'll be honest with you, Bob, I still don't understand what that means, but I just go with it. Um, <laughs> that's our podcast next week or this Friday <laughs> is on shoulder season. Yeah. Well, I wanted to tee that up for you. Uh, I, yeah, this will drop after, but either way, that's funny. Yeah. Uh, no. Um, so, but yeah, that's, we meet, probably every day. And then, um, every day I have a one-on-one -on -one with one of the leaders on my executive leadership team before all that starts just as a, like, and it's more meant to be a, you know, what's going on with your kids. Yeah. You know, it's a time for them to come to me, not for me to them, because it's ultimately my responsibility to support them than it is for them. Me. I mean, I, yeah. Um, and so that usually then cascades into other things that come through, but we're a very communicative, uh, organization now just because that's the way I need to be. I mean, that's, I mean, my love language, which isn't necessarily a love language, the communication, but like, I, I need to talk to people. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I know Jimmy really well and I know they get together every day, their leadership team and they have a yeah. huddle and they talk about what's going on, what's, you know. Where do we need to have a side conversation? Maybe if you really something's going on, I, the, the value of, of conversation and and bo watching body language and seeing how people interact. Yeah, then you, you find out maybe someone's not happy with another department because they changed something and didn't think about how it would change the other department, like you mentioned earlier. You know, yeah. you get it out in the air rather than let it fester. So I think it's so important. It is. Yeah, I went through when I went through grad school. I um. I took a class on emotional intelligence. Oh, really? Talking about all the different ways that people communicate. You know, some people are face to face. Some people would prefer to see things in email form and then respond in email form. Some people want to see an email. They'll get up right away and they'll come talk to you. Some people don't like the confrontation. And, 
you know, then it all makes sense, you know, like from seven years ago when I had a leader tell me I'm slightly abrasive and I was like, no, I'm not. I'm just really passionate, you know, <laughs> um, you know, but those experiences are the things that, you know, I've kind of allowed me to, you know, to listen to the body language and to know. So I know that some of my leaders don't necessarily want to bring stuff out, but they know that that's how I communicate. So I do my very best to be respectful of those boundaries and how they communicate. Sometimes I can, depending on how many cups of coffee I've had, I can come off a little excited. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I like it. I like it. Uh, I want to get I want to get more into in the customer acquisition and and I mean this amazing uh, trajectory you've had the last. We've talked about how uh, you know you're moving to new zip codes and um, maybe let's I, I want to hard before we get yeah let's let's harness let's let's talk marketing a little bit more because you earlier on you said boy I don't trust this marketing partner I have they're taking credit for top line growth which is silly you know so I got to do a deep dive and educate myself on where my leads are coming. So maybe yeah. talk about that a little bit more. How did you finally discover what was working and what is working for you guys? I know, I don't know how your call volume has been this year. Where there's a lot of other markets that they're struggling a little bit. And, yeah. uh, and to go back to your call center thing, sometimes it's, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a whole nother conversation, but, uh, but anyways, talk about your evolution of marketing. Yeah. So, you know, something that I'd come to, and this is just my personal observation, conclusion, and opinion is it's marketing's job to get me back to where I was last year on leads. It's the rest of the organization's job to get us over that threshold for whatever that is. And if that's by, you know, ultimately we want word of mouth advertising, you know what I mean? So we want somebody to refer their neighbor to us or, or whatever that is. So I, after doing, you know, almost two plus years of data dive on marketing and talking with, you know, countless other brands and, and different PPC, you know, providers and, you know, everybody's a salesman, Bob. I don't know if you do that in marketing. Um, you know, I've come kind of to the conclusion that marketing is only going to get you to a certain point. And, And for me, that was back to where I was last year. Um, even if you spend more money the next year, because your click cost is going to be substantially more because somebody catches on to what the good guys are doing. Yeah. Um, so what I've really tried to do is understand where the marketing leads are coming from, which type. And, you know, a lot of you guys use call source, you've got different numbers and you throw different phone numbers on there, but we really went back through into our call center. Instead of having like 30 different dropdown options, we really kind of brought it down to like six or seven. You know what I mean? Of where that was. And the other thing that I did is if you're an existing club member, like I don't care if you went onto the internet, like that's not a PPC internet leap. Like you were mine to begin with. You just didn't remember what my phone number was, even though you know my jingle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So that doesn't count. So I kicked all that stuff out. So then we had to like retool our CSRs and our CPs to be like, hey, if they're not a club member, we really need you to find out like where it was. You know, was it a billboard? Was it on a mailer? was that whatever that was. And then we started to do the revenue attribution back to those lead types for that month and that spent. So now Amanda, who started as a part-time CEP and is now my marketing director, she knows every single month what my cost per impression share is for every single channel, every station, based upon what flows through and then what's my ROAS for that type of marketing? So then when we're looking at it moving forward, if I want to throttle marketing dollars to something that I know is working, I know what it is. And I'm not guessing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I love it. And I would tell you, I mean, PPC is going to be a, a lion's share of most people's budget and it is mine as well. So, but I mean, we've picked up different tricks. We've, you know, GLSA was something that we added in the last you know, a year that's been successful at times. And then sometimes I have like, we are spending way too much money on this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or other companies are struggling with, you know, not having the maintenance member backlog that we do. So they 
throttle up their spend when it's 70 degrees out. My wife has the windows open and I throttle my spend back down because I'm like, it's, you're not going to get your return. So we, we track all of those things regularly. Like we know where our best return is. We know what we're going to do next year when we put contracts in place with certain TV partners, just because the cost per impression share wasn't where other people's were. And we're not getting that haul or that, you know, booking on schedule engine or whatever that is that we feel like we should based upon the amount of spent putting it. Yeah. What do you, what do you in kind of in general spending annually? 10% is the number we kind of always throw out. Is it more than that, less than that? No. So last year we spent 5% um, over our top line. And this year my goal is to finish like right around 4.6, 4.7%. And you're not hurting for leads at all this year. Um, I would, I would tell you that I'm I'm su- I'm pleasantly surprised with where my lead count is. Knocking on and wood that, right now. What well, right? Knock it. Ramming it. I don't know yeah. if that counts. Um, yeah. But I don't. I think for me, I can't justify the additional cost. Because when I look at all the data points, I don't see that return. Um, and I get to a point where I've done such a deep dive on the data that I go, if I throw another two percentage points on there, I'm looking at another $40,000 in marketing spend somewhere. And if I'm already at a 50% impression share on my primary and secondary search terms in Grand Rapids, like I need to generate hundred and ninety thousand dollars in top line to get a twenty two percent twenty three percent EBITDA to make up that additional thirty thousand dollars and like I just and I go I don't see how I can get another hundred fifty thousand dollars in in revenue this month I just don't know where it would come from so what's been the most effective do you think or I know what it it, it, it alter you know changes month by month and season and where you know with demand versus it's it's the shoulder season and no one's thinking about <laughs> yeah. you know they're 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 tuning up in the fall or whatever so is have you been able to pinpoint what is really effective for you typically i mean man it's that's really difficult uh, and again i don't want to try to get like try to weasel my way out of this finding you right. but um you know the vredevo name carries such a such a a good brand in our market that a lot of it is is from that um the the best marketing tool that we have found bob that we don't really pay any money for in the back end is people are always like oh the guys with the blue vans yeah you know, so we had a unique blue van and we've got 120 vans on the road every single day and every van's touching on average three houses a day you know and that's been one of the biggest things and so we put we put um what are those things called the scan the um qr codes qr codes yeah on the on every one of our vans we put them up on our billboards so that if people see it or if you know one of our guys at a speedway gas station you know getting something for lunch or whatever they can go up there and it just lands right on our schedule engine page wow Um, that's a good you know, so we've done a ton of like things that I would consider groundbreaking. And I'm like, Hey, we did that for the first time. And then I go to like expo or I go to HR and I'm like, somebody did that before. So it wasn't, <laughs> but I'm like, we did it for the first time here, you know, in your market. Uh, that's all that matters. As long as you're the trendsetter there, you know? So, I mean, we, we do a lot of traditional billboards too, mm-hmm. and that's more of just a market saturation thing for me. Sure. Um, and then GLSA has worked really well in our area, Bob, and that's been a nice pickup for us. But what I wouldn't tell you about that is I know from having other partners in the industry that it doesn't work in all locations. Every, every market. So like for us, GLSA was, was nice. Obviously our, our PPC, you know, partners have done a really nice job of targeting things that just that we want. You know what I mean? Um, As far as getting marketed tune-ups and what are our secondary and primary campaigns. Um, And we do like cheesy commercials, Bob. I'm not going to lie. Like 
We're, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Are there members? Um, like we're we'll we'll be rolling out another one here for a local high school football frenzy where my own kids poke fun of the pronunciation of the Vrede Vogue name. You know, but yeah. Mike and Tom started that 20 years ago, and it's just like an honor and tribute to Vreda what you know Vreda yeah. who you know, and it's just, <laughs> I think. I think, you know, keeping it light and playful on those things is is important in a market where you're trying to build that relational value. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. Like, I, again, I, you know, I, I just had a meeting with Jimmy, so that's why I keep thinking of He All he does is run goofy ads on, in, in DFW, and, and it's just him doing silly things. The people, they make him smile, and if it makes you smile, you remember it. I, you know, in comparison, I'm in the St. Louis market, and there's a company that spends, I don't know how much is, official, you know, HVAC company of the St. Louis. And I swear to God, I can't remember their name because the guy looks like he's death worn over and just talks in a monotone. Oh my God. I don't want him anywhere near my house, let alone my kids. Yeah. You know, I'm like, it, it, yeah. it just matters. You know, that's your brain. For sure. you, got, you know, if you can make people smile, I'm like, Oh, I, you make me smile over a television commercial. I'm thinking I'm going to smile when I have you. I, uh, that brand is so important. Yeah, you know, and and we've done kind of a resurgence too. Like I told you before, we jumped on and kind of what our vision is going to look like for the next two years. Yeah, you know, and that's really focusing on you know our club membership program. Like you know, we've got a certain goal of how many we want to hit. You know, by twenty twenty five, and and what that takes is just you know those back to the basics things. Like we, I felt like we were missing the opportunity to be grateful to our club members when we talked to them. And it's not that they don't know, but we just had to retool something. So when, you know, if somebody had to call on an invoice or call on a rebate, the first thing that we should say is, hey, Bob, thanks for being a club member. The reason why I'm calling yeah. is this, you know, and I think, you know, things are tight right now in the economy. You know what I mean? I, I don't know about you, but I usually have some type of CNBC or Fox business or whatever, just trying to figure out like, Anybody else, I feel like it's Kentucky windage and you never know where it's going to go. But I can tell you that the dollar is is getting stretched more than it ever has. So I want to make sure that when people start to do their budget reviews, they don't they don't put their $17 a month or $18 a month first on the chopping block. I want them to know that their club membership is more important than their Netflix subscription. And we need to tell them that we're grateful. And the reason that they it's beneficial to them to have us come to their home twice a year, potentially more. So, you know, those are the things that we we're really focused or hyper focused on right now. Um, that, you know, we always have been, but it's just, it, it took a refresh. It's going to take some, you know, some new leaders and some new positions to kind of help us take some blinders off and identify I, some other opportunities like I did when I came in and we're super excited about, you know, the next 12 to 24 months. I know some other people are, you know, a little concerned, but I'm excited. I, I think that, you know, steel gets forged in fire, you know, so, yeah. you know, we're, we're ready to go. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a lot of great companies I know that came out of the recession looking great because they did the right things they needed to and everyone else was going out of business. Um, I, I would be, I, I have to ask, what other little tweaks have you made your club membership to, to really, you know, tighten that up and make sure you don't, you don't lose that ownership of that customer. Is there anything that comes to mind? You know, we're doing some things now too that, you know, Amanda had come up with where we're sending newsletters to all of our club members that don't have any offers. Yeah. I don't know. They're just like, Hey, meet this technician or these people Untouched. at these. Yeah. So we're just trying to be more personal with them, you know, and, and we've offered things like, you know, free plumbing safety inspections to, to let them know that we're now offering plumbing, you know, or, or things like that, just as a, Hey, you've been a club member for 10 plus years with us or five plus years from that. We'd love to offer you a free plumbing safety inspection. Here's what that looks like. We're going to do a leak test on all of your toilets. We're going to take a look at your water quality and we're, and we've told our plumbers don't go there expecting a sale. Like that's not what that's for. It is there for them to know we offer plumbing and it's going to be just as good a service as it is in the HVAC side. And we want them to tell their neighbor 
about the plumbing. We don't necessarily even want them to buy anything. Like, but we want them to have the experience to be our cheerleader, to tell other people that we've got plumbing and it's better than anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. You want to kind of put a stake in that homeowner and go, this is mine. I'm going to earn them and I will get the business for the next 10 years because they go, man, Joe, that tech was so nice. And yeah. yeah it's, well, it's, it's, and I, when I had run, you know, some sales calls too, they'd be like, man, I, you know, I wish you guys did this. Or I wish yep. you did that because you guys are, your customer service is, is so good. You know, and I, and I thought to myself, like, we need to be the best customer service business in the state of Michigan. And, and that's what we tell people too. Like, Hey, we're in the customer service industry. We just happen to be really good at HVAC and plumbing. You know, if you want me to do your garage door, I'll, I'll call Gus because I, I'm not quite there yet. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, um, but I mean, that's how we got into generators. We just kind of turned that on in the last five or six months. Like, I don't necessarily have a plan to exponentially grow generators. It's a total niche product. But somebody said, would you put this in? And I overheard the conversation. I was like, we'll do it. You know, and yeah. just, you know, we've probably done 15 or 20, you know, and it's just like, I don't want to lose an HVAC customer to somebody else who offers electrical and then they bolt on HVAC and they stole my customer. Yeah. Like if you're mine, like you're going to be mine. You know what I mean? Like we're in this through thick and thin, as long as you own that home. So if you need something done and we don't do it, call me and tell me what that is. And I'll see if I can figure it out for you. Um, I, I want to start wrapping it up just in the interest of your time. I appreciate the, this is, I could talk to you for two hours because I feel like <laughs> we've just skimmed the top on about 12 yeah. different topics. I could talk to you for an hour on each. Um, just just to kind of summarize our relationship with you, certain path. What what has our organization meant to, to Red Vigo over the years and now with the plumbing and, and, and moving forward? Yeah, you know, and I think now it's more of like that 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 home touch point, if you will, you know, um, to where it, it kind of gives us that if we feel like we're starting to kind of waver off course. Like we always know where to go back to get a resource. Um, you know, but to those of you guys who are just coming on board or just thinking about it, like the Vreda Oaks built their business on the principles of certain path. I mean, an SGI at the time, you know, so when I went to San Antonio, we didn't have a single comfort advisor walk for a variety of reasons. Pandemic, they didn't know if it was going to happen. And I made a goal at that time that like every one of my guys was going to walk at some point in time. So Washington, D.C., all nine of my sales guys walked across the stage, you know, and that was that was a really cool moment. And I remember being in San Antonio thinking. This is a really cool thing that no other industry has, like in manufacturing, you can go to Fabtech and. Atlanta or whatever that is. And all they're doing is trying to sell you high dollar capital equipment. You know, yep. this is a legitimate resource. Um, and I actually, you know, a good buddy of mine, um, Jared from Masters Heating and Cooling in Fort Wayne, he just yep. came on board, you know, two or three weeks ago because he had oh, come up to our shop multiple times and he was like, we need to run our business the same way you do. And I was like, well, you should probably join certain path then because yeah, they're going to have way more resources than me, you know? So it's been, again, it got us to $20 million and from 20 to 40, it's just been a, it's been a pulse check for us. Like, Hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to log into my hub and see if there's something on that before I try and reinvent, the wheel. you know, and there's some things that we've had to do just because there's not a ton of guys that are $40 million. Um, but don't let that dissuade you. You know what I mean? Like there's always a resource that's available. I mean, our, um, you know, our liaison, you know, sent us a note said, Hey, I want to do a P and L review. And I was like, Scott, that's all you, man. Like I got stuff to do, but yeah. Uh, yeah. It's been great, Bob. I mean, we, it, we've been really fortunate. Our guys look forward to the event, obviously in the spring every year, yeah. but, um, it, it, it's been a true partnership, you know, at a minimum that we have taken advantage of. Let's talk again, just kind of summarizing your vision here. First of all, how do you protect your culture? 
going from 20 to $40 million. You've got a lot of new people, a lot of new faces. How have you made sure to keep that same great vibes, feeling going? And, you know, it's real easy for that to go stray when you're bringing this many new faces in. So how have you been able to protect? Well, I think, you know, we talked about it at the beginning, but a lot of it's just honoring, you know, what was here before and not losing sight of what was built before I got here. Um, and that's kind of what we did with our, you know, cast our vision is, you know, we're, we, we are marching towards 25,000 club members by 2025, you know, and, and we can't get there without doing it the way that we've always done it, you know, and, you know, how do we, you know, protect that too, is I think we got to be respectful of the leaders that are in this organization and continue to provide them opportunities to grow, you know, so that was, you know, a lot of it was, you know, we, we, we built up our organizational chart and put the right people in the right place to be successful. I just get out of their way, you know, and I think for the first, you know, probably year and a half when I was, you know, in the role or in charge, people would come to me and say, Hey, you know, can I do this? And I would say, does it take care of our technician? Does it take care of the customer? You know, is it going to take care of the business? And they would be like, yeah, yeah. I'd be like, well, then do it. Like, don't come and ask me. Like, if it doesn't work, like, we're going to know quick because we monitor the results. You know what I mean? And if we screw up, like, it is what it is. Like, right. No big deal. So, like, you've got to give your leaders a runway to make mistakes. Like, you can't have them fearful that they're going to make a mistake. I mean, I was so telling somebody in my finance scene today, like, Hey, I make mistakes like at least five or six a day, like just at work. I can't tell you how many times I probably make mistakes, you know, for my wife or my kids, you know, but like you got to have that flexibility to where they're not feeling like they're un under pressure or feel for fearful of their job because they want to try something new. So as long as their decision falls within what our core values are, like do it, like it's fine, go do it. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Like we'll figure it out. It's just eating and cool. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Okay. Last question. You said you've reset your vision and mission statement for the next 18 months, two years, I think you said. So what does that look like? If you hit what you're aspiring to hit, what does the company look like uh, at the end of that period? Yeah. You know, so we didn't talk a, uh, a revenue number at our big company meeting just because, you know, I think a lot of people can appreciate, you know, when you start talking, you know, 40, 50, $60 million, people immediately want to know, well, how much more money are they going to make? You know what I mean? Or, or they're resentful of the the money and not the vision of what we're trying to do to take care of clients. Good but point. Yeah. Again, we're trying to have full electrical trades with our right. own electricians in house by 2025. We want to be able to service 25, thousand club members in mid west michigan and southwest michigan by that time frame and we want to have two more physical locations that we are loading up out of by then as well that's exciting well i i cannot thank you enough ryan for all your time we went well past an hour i know you said uh you didn't have too much hanging over your head there but i know there's plenty of things you could be doing crushing some data or figuring figuring some things out so like, I cannot thank you enough for all this time. I really enjoyed the conversation. No, I appreciate you having me on. And and again, um, it's it's been a blast to be a part of. Certain Path has been great for us. And um, you know, shout out to my leadership team again. Thanks for you know putting me in this position to be here. Thanks so much, Brian. Have a great rest of your day. Hey, you too, Bob. Support for this podcast comes from Synchrony. Ever wonder how to calculate your true cost of financing and how to fit the price of financing into your business and pricing for products and services? In Secrety's new and improved Toolbox website, you can easily calculate your cost of credit, view educational videos, and learn more about Synchrony's digital tools. Simply go to toolbox.syf.com to explore and learn more. Support for this podcast comes from Moen. As the number one faucet brand in North America, Moen offers a diverse selection of thoughtfully designed kitchen, bath, and smart water security products, each delivering the best possible combination of meaningful innovation, useful features, and lasting value. 
Moen strives to be the most durable, reliable, and easy to install brand of faucets. Moen leans on pros to help continue to drive consumer innovation needs and influence Moen's engagement with consumers in a meaningful way. For more information, visit plumber.moen.com. The Successful Contractor Podcast is part of the Certain Path family. Certain Path builds successful home service businesses and has for 23 years. We do it by providing contractors with a proven path to success, professional coaching, software solutions, and a member community of over 1,000 contractors just like you. Doubling your sales with a 20% net profit and an inspiring company culture is all possible. Let us show you the way. With Certain Path, success is made certain. Visit www.mycertainpath.com for more information.